one course information. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Hello, I wonder if you could help me. I'm interested in enrolling in your MBA programme. Could you give me some information, please? Yes, of course. I'll take a few details first of all, and I'll give you a copy of our prospectus. Oh, that's OK. I already have one here. I've been researching the MBA courses in the local area, so I already have lots of course information. That's great. OK, so first of all, can you tell me your name, please? Yes, of course. It's Anne Horbury. Horbury. Is that H-A-W-B-E-R-R-Y? Yes, that's right. OK. And what's your date of birth, Ms Horbury? The 22nd of May, 1981. That's great. And you were born in the UK? Yes, I was. All right. Can you give me some contact details, please? Sure. My address is 26 Simon Place in Brighton. And my telephone number is 01903 714 721. Sorry, can you tell me your contact number once again? Yes, it's 01903 714 721. OK, great. And do you have a mobile phone number? No, I don't. Is it important? No, that's OK. I'll just write it on your form, no mobile phone. Now, just a few additional questions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Are you working or studying anywhere else at the moment? Yes, I'm working for Lloyd Enterprise in the city as a secretary and I'm also attending a computer course part-time in the evenings. Great. So can you give me some details about your educational background? We need to make sure that your qualifications match the entry requirements. Yes. I completed a business degree a year ago. I've been working since my graduation, but the job market is very competitive these days, so I'd like to do some postgraduate study now. OK, that sounds fine. Your degree is relevant, and it's good that you have some work experience too. I do need to warn you, though, that our MBA programme is extremely popular and gets full quickly. So would you be interested in applying for any alternative courses if your application is not successful this time? Well, my first choice would, of course, be the MBA. But yes, I've had a good look through your prospectus and I would also be interested in the international marketing course. That's great. It's always a good idea to keep your options open just in case. Finally, can you tell me where you learned about our courses here? Actually, my cousin studied the MBA course two years ago, and she recommended it to me. OK, well, thank you for coming in today. I will pass your details on to our admissions department. They should contact you this week with a formal application form, and they usually invite MBA candidates to come in for an interview. OK, well, thanks for your time. No problem. Good luck with your application. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part 2 You will hear part of an introductory talk on nutrition. First, look at questions 11 to 14.
Listen carefully. Good afternoon. Many people in the Western world eat the wrong food, and they eat far too much of it. So the topic of my lecture today is healthy eating. I'll divide my talk into three parts. Firstly, I'm going to define what I mean by healthy eating. After that, I'll go on to talk about why people don't eat properly, and then I'll finish my lecture with some ideas for improving the situation. Right. So, what do I mean by healthy eating? Well, some people might think it means eating a lot of meat. Um, of course, vegetarians wouldn't agree with this. They think eating meat is very unhealthy. Other people think that eating a lot of cabbage is good for you, or a lot of salad. Well, naturally, cabbage, salad, and meat can all be part of healthy eating. But for me, healthy eating means two things. One is eating a balanced diet, and the other is eating the right amount of food. In my opinion, a balanced diet means eating a variety of foods, including meat, vegetables, fruit, cereals, and dairy foods. Obviously, the amount of food we should eat is more difficult to decide. It depends a lot on how active we are. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now on to my next point: Why do so many people eat badly? Well, let's look first at having a balanced diet. To have a balanced diet, you have to plan your meals in advance and then buy the right food, and then take time to cook it properly. But these days, people are so busy working that they don't have time to go shopping, so they end up buying fast food at the last minute. Another reason people don't eat well nowadays is that it's actually cheaper to buy food already prepared in a packet. So people who haven't got much money will buy packet food rather than cook something fresh. And a final reason why people don't eat healthily. Is that they don't know how to. In my opinion, schools don't do nearly enough to educate their pupils in healthy eating habits. And now to my third and last point: What can we do to solve the problem? Well, I think it can be solved by three main groups: families, schools, and the government. To start with, parents should make sure their children have a healthy diet. Secondly, a lot of schools have self-service machines where their pupils can buy soft drinks, crisps, sweets, and chocolates. I think schools should change what they sell in these machines. Another thing schools can do is make sure that the food they serve in their canteens is fresh and well balanced. And to finish, I'll briefly mention two of the measures I think the government should take to encourage healthy eating. One is to limit advertising unhealthy food, and the other is to spend more money on educating the public about the benefits of a healthy diet. In my next lecture, I'll go into more detail about them. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a conversation between a tutor and two students. In the first part of the discussion, they talk about a fellow student. First, look at questions twenty-one to twenty-three. As you listen, answer the questions. Write no more than two words for each answer. Ah, Francis and Steve. Hi. Now, before we start the tutorial, am I right in thinking that you haven't heard about Lorraine? No. What about her? Um, she's already left. What? Well, she hasn't told anyone. You sound surprised. Weren't you half expecting it? Yes, but she could at least have told us, though. We've been on the course together for the past three years, and it would have been nice to know. She always was the sort to keep herself to herself. Yes, I know what you mean. Did she give any reason? Well, she got that job. What? Yes, and she's been given permission to leave, as there's only a week to go before the end of the course. But she'll be back for the exam week. Oh well, we'll just have to catch her on the mobile after the class. She's gone back to Wales first. Oh dear. We'll get hold of her on the mobile. She did say that it might not be possible to contact her for a couple of weeks. Oh, okay. If that is what she wants. Before the conversation continues, look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. The tutor and the two students are talking about assessment marks. For questions twenty-four to thirty, there are four alternatives: A, B, C, and D. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer, and circle the correct letter. Right to work. We're here to look at your assessment marks for your coursework. I take it you haven't seen them yet. No, <laughs> not yet. Well, you'll both be pleased. In fact, very pleased. Yes, Francis, you have come out with the top mark in the year. Oh, you have, in fact, got a starred first. Wow, aren't you pleased, Francis? Yes, I'm just speechless. <laughs> And、um, what about me? Well, Steve, you got a first as well. <laughs>、oh. I don't believe it. <laughs> you might have done even better, but there were a few faults with the five thousand word project you did on traffic management. And what about the book review we had to do? Yours was, I can safely say, the best we have ever had. <laughs> You're kidding! I'm not. In fact, you have won the departmental prize for the piece. It's a pity, really, that your project wasn't of the same caliber. It's still not bad at all, though, is it? It certainly isn't. What do you think were the faults with your project?、Uh, I just wasn't very happy with the conclusion, and I got myself in a bit of a twist with the argument about road pricing. By and large, your overall conclusions were okay, and I would say that your thoughts on road pricing were quite original. The problem was more with the actual end. It was a bit disappointing. You started off well, but then it ended rather suddenly, as if you got fed up with it. <laughs> yes, I did kind of stop fairly abruptly. I couldn't think of much to say, even though I knew it was important.
Yes, that section needed a bit more work on it. But, as I said, by and large, it was very good. And, Francis, mm -hmm. your project was excellent. So much so that we think you should take it further and perhaps do a PhD or at least an MPhil. What do you think? Um, <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it. I've just been concerned with getting through this final year and getting all the coursework and exams out of the way. I can understand that. But I do think that you ought to consider it seriously. If you perform as well in your exams as in your project work, you're on course for a first. Do you think that I'd get funding for it? Well, any grant will be discretionary, but you have as good a chance as anyone else. I'd even say a much better one. Mm. If you do get a first, it'll be the only one we've had in this department for three years. And I'd be happy to be your supervisor. Thanks. I'd like that. Do you think I should start applying for it now or wait until after the exams? I think you must really start thinking about it as soon as you can. Mm. And Steve, what about you? Have you thought about going on to do research? I have thought about it, but... I have a job lined up if I get a good degree. And quite honestly, I am fed up with not having enough money to do the things I would like to do. <laughs> I can understand that. Is there anything that either of you would like to talk about? Yeah. I have a couple of things I'd like to ask, if you don't mind. OK. We have roughly uh, 20 minutes left. So, Steve, would you like to go first? Right. Um... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about the Great Barrier Reef. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Despite its name, the Great Barrier Reef isn't just one large coral reef. Rather, it's a system of coral reefs that stretches along the east coast of Australia, covering an area of around 300,000 square kilometres. The Great Barrier Reef is composed of approximately 3,000 individual reefs, which range in size from one hectare to more than 10,000 hectares each. In addition, around 600 islands are scattered throughout the area, particularly at the northern and southern ends. The reefs themselves are composed of over 400 different kinds of coral, the largest variety of corals found anywhere in the world. Thousands of species of sea animals live in and around the reefs. Altogether, approximately 1,500 species of fish inhabit the reef area, including a number of different kinds of sharks. One of the more interesting mollusks to be found in the reefs is the giant clam. This huge shellfish can live for more than 100 years and can weigh as much as 200 kilos. Sea mammals abound in the area, which serves as a breeding ground for certain types of whales, many of which are endangered. Over 200 species of sea and shorebirds feed, roost or nest among the reefs and islands. 
Many types of reptiles can also be found living among and near the reefs. Saltwater crocodiles, for example, inhabit the marshes along coastal areas. Amphibians include at least seven species of frogs inhabiting the islands of the reef. Unfortunately, this wondrous area of the world is threatened by climate change. Rising sea temperatures have led to an effect called coral bleaching, that is, large numbers of corals dying off, especially in the shallower areas of the reef. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority is attempting to find effective ways to deal with this issue that threatens the reef. One proposed solution involves shading the reef in certain areas to help keep the surrounding water temperatures down. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.